Uh, many of you were on the Moodle basic workshops last week, and uh, I have to say that those were really forced marches through a whole ton of, of me presenting stuff. And uh, hopefully today's uh, session will, will be less of a forced march, uh, more of a facilitated conversation. Um, we've got a good crowd here, so we've got plenty of voices around the table. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how that goes. I, um, I will start off with um, going through some slides, but there'll be times when um, uh, I've got a Google Doc for us to work on uh, for some things this afternoon. And um, there'll be a, a fair chunk in the middle where you'll all be working individually on a course planning document. Um, and then we'll be coming back to, uh, to share uh, to share out what um, what your thoughts about um, how you can apply that course planning document to your fall courses. So let me go ahead. I think we're almost mostly here now. I'm going to go ahead. I will start uh, share my screen for a bit. I do want to go through a few slides just to kind of set set the framework for us and. Um, you know, Marie's on the chat uh, and on the call and we'll be monitoring the chat as well. And hopefully between the chat, between, you know, people turning your mics on, we can spend some time having a conversation as well as just going through material this afternoon. So um, I think I won't even go into full screen mode on the presentation here. Let me just click through some of these slides. Um, what we'll be doing this afternoon is uh, spending a little bit of time talking about the pivot uh, to remote instruction last spring. I want to do that in the context of exploring different kinds of course designs and how that can help us think about this balance between synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning activities. Um, I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, Carnegie credit requirements and how that works in some of these different models. As I said, there'll be a fair chunk of time in the middle-ish of the session where you'll all have some time to work individually uh, on this uh, module mapping exercise and we'll then follow it up with some uh, wrap-up discussion. So what I want to do first is I want us to go back to before uh, the pandemic hit and to think about how we were managing our courses back in those good old days, uh, if we want to put it that way. And I want to focus um, first on um, the fact that pri primarily here at Purchase, we have face-to-face uh, -face classes. And those classes are clearly structured around a specific class time. Uh, my geology class last fall, uh, met for the lecture from on Monday and Thursday from 12.30 to 2.10, for example. And we had that scheduled class time. Uh, it is by definition, those class times by, are by definition synchronous sessions. We're all there in the room at the same time. Um, by and large, our class times are instructor-led or instructor-directed. Um, but beyond that, there is some, some variation. So I, I want to start off with a little activity here. Let me copy this link. And stop the share so I can actually get back to the chat. Um, I want you all to go to this Google Doc for a bit. 
And let me go back to screen sharing. Uh, the Zoom menus always show up when I don't want them and they don't show up when I need them. So um, pick one of these center, uh, one of the cells in this center column that no one else is, uh, is uh, working in and just kind of describe the kinds of typical activities you would have planned for your synchronous, real-time, face-to-face class time sessions before we did this whole pivot to remote instruction. We'll spend, you know, five minutes or so doing this. And there should be plenty of um, plenty of rows, so uh, you know, pick one where no one's working and just start uh, describing how you would approach your face-to-face -face time. And do it in the center columns over here for now. Just focus on on. Um, what what you would do in class. So we've got a, a nice diversity of uh, descriptions of 
in in class activities. Let me highlight this row. This column. So uh, we've got peer-to-peer um, -peer interviewing, small group discussions, we've got homework problems, we've got PowerPoint presentations, we've got exercises on new materials, we've got small group discussions, demonstrations, uh, group critiques, slide lectures, 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 small group discussion, class discussion, group critiques, entire class discussions on current events, pop-up questions, discussions, problems. So a, a wide range of things. Um, I see a few common um, instructional approaches that I would have expected. Um, I mean, we have a lot of you who are uh, in um, in class, doing various kinds of lecture presentations. We've got uh, discussions, small group discussions, whole class discussions. We've got critiques. Uh, we've got working on problem sets. and other applied activities. Uh, and so there's lots of different ways um, that we structure our class time. But certainly there's a, even at purchase, which is focused on thinking wide open and, and um, you know, having the different, the diversity of programming we have. We still have a fair amount of, of lecture going on, presentations, as well as some of these other things. Uh, wrapped around those class times would then, of course, be uh, the kinds of activities we would want our students to engage in outside of class, either beforehand or following up. And whereas by def definition, the class times are synchronous, um, these out of class activities are almost by definition asynchronous. They um, need to be self paced on the part of the students. Students aren't expected to do within certain limits, uh, particular pre-class activities at a particular uh, time on a particular day. Uh, they are to some extent student directed, although of course we say, please do this reading by this time. And we you know, have this, these assignments or whatever homework um, that are due at, at other times. Um, for those of you who are still back into the, Yeah, go ahead and fill in what you would normally have students do, you know, in advance of class to prepare for class and uh, and following up class um, in the Google Doc spreadsheet, uh, Google Doc form that we've got here going. Uh, So I see, you know, as expected, we expect our students to work through class materials, readings, and so forth at a time. Um, writing, I'm wondering if that is like writing response papers to the reading, um, working on product of various kinds that they might be expected to bring into the classroom. A lot of readings, 
a lot of readings, homework, readings, critiques. Okay. And then um, I, uh, activities that you have your students do to follow up um, afterwards. So it so looks like a writing class, you know, write your thesis statement, share and critique the statements, rewrite them, revise homework, revise critiques, go to office hours, writing assignments, uh, visit a ex exhibition, so forth. So, I mean, none of this we're going over here is necessarily rocket science. I just want to just pull this out, though, because, you know, we're, we're used to thinking about our typical regular face-to-face -face, uh, courses and having this rhythm of um, getting ready for class, having class, following up with class, some of those activities, the ones outside of our class time, obviously, are where we're having students do the asynchronous activities. Then we've got a time when we come together and um, do various kinds of synchronous activities, um, and, then, uh, and then follow that up. This um, basic model has been around for, you know, well over a century or more, uh, structured around the Carnegie Credit Hour. Um, for those of you who aren't necessarily um, versed in all of this stuff let me just go through because it will it will be important for some of the conversation we talk about later so um you know this might be a review for for many of you but one credit hour from a carnegie credit hour perspective is one hour of contact last time and we're really here talking about lecture classes um per week for the 15 weeks of the semester. Now, in reality, one hour essentially means 50 minutes. And so a four credit hour class at purchase is typically broken up into two 100 minute classes if we're talking about a Monday, Thursday or Tuesday, Friday class. Um, theoretically, it should be one 200 minute class, um, although I'm not sure that they all necessarily follow that model. Uh, so my geology lecture uh, class uh, section, for example, going back to that Monday, Thursday, 1230 to 210, the 100 minutes on Monday and the 100 minutes on Thursday basically come up to be four contact hours for my lecture class for, for that week times 15 weeks. Plus, uh, obviously, uh, all of the work that we expect students to do outside of class. Generally speaking, um, students are expected to do two hours of work outside of class, either pre-class prep or homework or all the other things we're asking them to do. Sometimes see two to three hours, but basically four and eight, uh, for a four credit hour course, there would be the two 100 minute class sessions and I should be able to expect my students to put in eight hours of work per week for my class uh, to get the four credits for, for the geology lecture. So um, this is what many of us were dealing with um, before we had to pivot to remote instruction. And uh, 
you know, whether that was the 200 minute sessions or some other uh, other slicing and dicing. Uh, now, mid-March comes, the pandemic hits, and we have to pivot to remote instruction. I know for a lot of faculty, this is what we did. Here is my class before we have to go to remote instruction. Here is my class after. Pretty much the same kind of thing. Uh, we're meeting in Zoom at the times when um, we used to meet face-to-face -face on campus. We still have the expectation of, of outside activities. Zoom class sessions are themselves, by definition, synchronous class times. And again, they tend to be instructor-led. Um, in terms of specifying what we're going to do when we meet um, uh, during class there. I'm actually going to, let's see. Let me actually stop share and bring everybody up here again. For those of you, uh, I mean, how many of you um, basically did the pivot that way? I had my face-to-face -face class. Yeah, uh, either raise your hand or or click the yes on the uh, or raise your hand on the, in the participants window. Go ahead, uh, those of you who want turn your mics on and say, you know, what what worked with that approach? You know, we were I told. Think, go oh, ahead. Sorry, uh, uh, this is teacher. Um, I noticed that students seemed comforted by meeting twice a week and seeing me. And you know, we talked a fair amount in addition to the lecturing. Yep. But I think that that it, in a way it was the same but different. Helped. Yeah. Uh, other comments? Uh, yeah. Um, we're we're a large group, but uh, Pat, just go ahead and and turn your mic on. Okay. Um, oh, it's on, right? Yep. Okay. Um, I would agree that they were very glad to see everybody um, and they were having a very hard time working on their own. Um, but what worked the most was when I broke them up and then I visited them in their room or not even. They just really, I think it was, it was hard to carry on a full class although we did that as well but they seem very good to me so uh, gar you have your hand up is that because you were just saying yes you did the the zoom pivot or did you want to add something oh uh, I, I i just wanted to say that's how i did the zoom uh, pivot and i also want to say <clears throat> that that structured way sort of worked for my students they looked forward to the meetings <clears throat> i also found that they wouldn't get off the call at the time that the class was supposed to end. I mean, one of my classes was supposed to end at 4.10 and I, we were all still on the call frequently till 4.30. Right. Yeah, so certainly we were all dealing with a lot of, of issues that were academic and non-academic and having that point of contact. Uh, Catherine? Uh, yes, I just responded to um, that that was a method that I used too, and I share Gara's sentiments. It's the same way with me. Yeah. So, in many respects, for faculty who who were um, who who had a face-to-face -face class running, we have students in the room. We have uh, you know we've developed our community uh, of 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 inquiry in the classroom there. The ability to switch to these synchronous Zoom sessions allowed us continuity of instruction. It allowed uh, fac uh, allowed students to maintain a point of contact that was very important when everything else in their world was perhaps topsy turvy, and um, and so certainly there are some nice advantages of in continuing to have these kinds of synchronous 
engagements with our classes as we're thinking about what we'll need to do for the fall, especially those of us who will have to continue to teach remotely in the fall. But um, I'd also like to hear what didn't work with this pivot to Zoom instruction in, in the, uh, and the focus on continuing the synchronous sessions online that we had face-to-face -face before we had to move. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I felt that in some ways the Zoom format ex like exaggerated the distinctions that were already there in the classroom where the students who were going to participate anyway felt totally comfortable participating and the students who wouldn't have participated it were even more able to disengage. Right. So the back of the room is much further back in a Zoom session than in a face-to-face -face classroom. I found to be one of the huge negatives was that we couldn't hear ourselves laugh. My laughter is an important component <laughs> in my classes. And um, to be telling jokes or to try to elicit laughter, I mean, uh, that was, I think, the single most problematic thing. Yep. Students may, they said they laughed, they would write me, I, I laughed, but you know, you can't hear them. Right. Uh, Gara? I agree. <clears throat> I think laughter and body language completely disappeared. Um, I also felt that everything, all the discussion had to be mediated through the instructor. Uh, the Zoom session actually uh, enhanced the hierarchical structure of a classroom. Yeah. Um, they couldn't talk to each other nearly as well as they can do in physical space. Um, and so they would say things to me and then I would say it to everybody and then someone else would say something to me and so on. Yeah. So uh, let's go to Nandita and then Nancy. I just, I just realized my audio and video was off. Um, it was hard to, uh, uh, you know, I, I typically have four hour classes uh, on, on each, uh, in each session. Uh, it was very hard to, to keep the momentum yes. uh, and to keep the students' attention uh, and the quality of conversations for four hours. It was also very hard um, to share work, visual work that they were doing uh, in a way where um, we could all take in the detailed aspects of it, you know, like there were limitations of scale depending on wherever these students were yeah. accessing Zoom. And so that kind of changed the conversation and the reading of the works um, to a very large extent. And, and Nancy, let, let me uh, get your comment in here and then I've got uh, some things to, to wrap up. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Um, I was just going to say to Gaura that one way I um, worked with that idea of the hierarchy was to make breakout rooms and let them have conversations that I didn't necessarily even hear, but it gave them a sense of agency and a little sense of, you know, being able to steer critiques or whatever it was. Um, yeah. So I would use that for not not a lot of the class, but for certain conversations that we were having. Yes, yeah, so I want to bring uh, reinforce a couple of points here. I mean, there was some conversation about the the Zoom format. Um, increasing the discussion hierarchy. Those students who were comfortable discussing in the face-to-face -face class were the ones most comfortable discussing in Zoom and the others more faded away. Uh, as, we, as you all think about the balance between synchronous and asynchronous activities, um, one thing uh, that I'll just say now because it fits in with that comment is for my face-to-face -face classes in the past, I've, also, I've often included a, uh, an online discussion component of, uh, for the face-to-face -face class because you oftentimes see that students who might be reticent to discuss in class 
they're they're not they're maybe introverted or they're they're uh, less um, sure of themselves in a, in a real-time conversation or they want time to sit back and think about their responses. Oftentimes I've found that students who have never sit, you know, pipe up in class unless we do something like small group discussion to get them really engaged will actually come, um, come on to the, the conversation and the uh, in the discussion forum that's online because they've got time to think about the topic and they can come up with oftentimes some of the most insightful comments that they would never make in a face-to-face -face class. So even without this question of, well, are we going to have to continue to do remote uh, because we can't meet face-to-face, -face, even when, we're, when you're back to, um, you know, face-to-face -face instruction, I would, you know, still have you think about how you could bring in some of these asynchronous uh, learning activities to augment what's going on in your classes. Um, let me share my screen again. Uh, so we kind of did this in uh, the face-to-face, -face. but I want to I want to bring up this uh, this issue as well. This was in a blog post that came out. Um, early into the pivot, and I thought it was a very good way of looking at some of these issues. And um, you can see the credits down here, uh, Daniel Stanford, this is Creatively Commons license, so you know if you want to take this and, and use it as well, it's, it's available. But what he did was to, in the blog post, and this, this figure doesn't capture all of the things he talked about, uh, distinguish between those activities we can do that um, are uh, high immediacy versus low immediacy. That is, to what extent do these activities, are, are they able to uh, engage students to be able to show, uh, to allow participants to really um, demonstrate their presence in the interaction as opposed to those that are are less uh, that have less Im immediacy to their feel but also those activities that require high bandwidth versus those that require low bandwidth and if you're thinking about zoom synchronous video conferences for maintaining your synchronous online class sessions that certainly can be high immediacy, although we've talked about the issue of students in the back of the Zoom room being more easily uh, able to, um, to disengage. But these are also very high bandwidth kinds of instructional approaches. Um, so, uh, did any of you have issues with your students just not being technically able to pull off attending Zoom sessions, given the circumstances they were they uh, had had to move into when they left campus? Did any of you? And of course, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see. Um, did any of your students have, uh, I can't make it because um, life is happening and um, and um, I, I actually just can't uh, uh, attend or I don't have the bandwidth or we've got one computer in the house and, uh, and my parents have to use it for work meetings at the time that we would normally have uh, our class scheduled. So, um, I guess I'm just going through this to kind of reinforce the point that the, the synchronous approach of using these real-time Zoom sessions were very important for allowing us to continue our instruction, were very important for uh, uh, keeping our contact with students, but they're not easy. They can be very difficult for students. And so as you're thinking about um, designing for the fall, you might want to think about rebalancing this mix between synchronous sessions and asynchronous sessions in order to um, best meet your needs and the needs of our students. 
what would be some of the advantages of shifting some of your instructional activities to asynchronous activities like online discussion forums or rather than lecturing in Zoom, doing lectures in VoiceThread that the students view on their own time before you get together? What would be some of the advantages of bringing in more of those asynchronous components? Uh, less chance of your child Zoom bombing you. <laughs> okay. A little bit more freedom on their side. They can choose their own time. Right. So that's the, one of the points I really wanted to to, uh, to make here, that uh, the, the Zoom sessions are probably the, the least flexible uh, approach to your students. You know, your Zoom session is scheduled for uh, Thursday at 12.30 and you're at, you as the instructor starting the Zoom session and if the student can't make it uh, then you know maybe you've recorded the session that they can watch later but you know it is, it is the least flexible whereas some of these asynchronous approaches uh, provide much more flexibility. Um, so let's go back into the slides. Now, in terms of thinking about these, um, the balance and different approaches, um, so we've got, you know, these kind of high demand, high immediacy activities. We've got other activities that don't require much bandwidth. Uh, they are more flexible. Anything that's over here on the low bandwidth side is probably going to be more flexible for our students. Um, and um, so you want to have some kind of balance between uh, a mix of activities that will keep students engaged, that won't be too taxing technologically, uh, that will uh, include a mix of things that provide them some flexibility um, and going forward. So um, I think we've kind of maybe discussed this. As you're thinking about this, uh, I, I think one framework you want to look at is uh, where, I mean, when we're running classes, we've got several things we need to do. We need to, there's, for almost all classes, there's a certain amount of, of just information, content about that topic that we have to get to the students and the students have to engage with and work on. We have hopefully opportunities for students to create, to construct meaning, to make sense around the materials, to, to take the, curriculum that's in our course and incorporate it into some framework of knowledge that they're developing either within their discipline or across disciplines. Many of us on the call today have a component where the students have to develop skills, whether that's artistic skills or writing skills or, or lab skills or critical reasoning. And so as you're thinking about these pre and post class and during class activities, um, you might want to be thinking about where, it, where are the students going to be focused on picking up the information? Where are we going to have activities that will allow students to construct meaning and so forth? Now, I just want to quickly throw out a couple of different models that um, are uh, variations or uh, variants uh, from this kind of standard face-to-face -face model. Uh, many of you might have uh, thought about flipped classroom in the past, where the idea is that with the flipped classroom approach, a lot of the basic information transfer and student uh, readiness uh, all over that material is actually offloaded to asynchronous activities before class. 
so that when we get together in class, we don't have to spend a lot of time lecturing over the material that the students should have already uh, learned and can spend time doing those critiques or peer reviews or small group discussions or other kinds of project activities. And then follow that up with, um, you know, other ac um, higher order thinking activities that will allow the students to further apply what they have consolidated during the um, synchronous class time. Now, to some extent, um, this is kind of a stereotypical uh, view of what we do in our traditional face-to-face -face classes. I mean, the, the stereotype is that oh, we get together so that we can lecture at students and they do all of their individual work uh, as homework or pre-class activities, whereas with a flipped classroom, we can offload that, that basic content delivery and spend the class time uh, looking at um, engaging the students in um, in uh, more active learning kinds of things. But if we look over uh, what you've all entered into the spreadsheet here, I mean, many of you are already approaching your classes in this kind of, to some extent, flipped classroom approach in that none of us probably are spending 100% of our our class time doing lectures. Lectures still seem to be a fairly common thing that we do when we get together with students, but at least some of you are already uh, maybe offloading some of that um, content delivery either through asynchronous lectures and or reading materials and um, freeing up time to do more active learning things in the classroom. Um, and ideally, um, you know, students would be able to do some of this basic content uh, mastery uh, before they get to class so that we can spend time in class doing more uh, applied uh, exercises and have the, the students then go on to do real creative projects afterwards. This is, this would, this would have been my, this was always my goal, for example, for my geology class. Spent a lot of time trying to get students to um, work through materials ahead of time so that we could spend more time doing um, and uh, applying and uh, application kinds of exercises. But I always spent more time lecturing in class than I really wanted to do. Um, so uh, again, with this flipped classroom model, we're talking about the same basic structure, but just trying to fine tune uh, what we're using the class time for. Um, and uh, therefore changing what we're expecting students to do outside of class. Um, taking this one step further, um, would be to actually develop a more blended hybrid uh, classroom model. And if you take a look here at either the flipped classroom or what we're talking about for our standard face-to-face -face, uh, slash remote instruction uh, classroom versus what's going on here, what's the big difference between the two? Somebody, un uh, unmute themselves and say how how is this how is this different from up here what's what's happened to the boxes just now <laughs> last what? time is is you know it has reduced um, yep. Yeah, so the key thing with these uh, blended slash hybrid models is that we are trading off some amount of seat time and moving more stuff into some of these uh, flexible, self-paced, uh, asynchronous learning activities. Um, I mean, there was the one example of how am I going to keep students engaged for a four-hour Zoom session? 
I, as instructor, wouldn't be able to keep engaged for a four-hour Zoom session. I'm kind of pushing it with the two-hour session this afternoon. Um, and of course, we could do things like uh, let's spend a little bit of time uh, having some presentation of material. Let's break up into breakout rooms so we can do small group discussions. Maybe during the Zoom session, you direct students out to some shared Google Doc where they can do some collaborative uh, work um, and so forth. Um, as long as you can set up an appropriate mix of um, asynchronous and synchronous activities to meet Carnegie requirements and meet the learning outcomes, you have some flexibility under the circumstances that we're operating under in the fall to actually uh, adjust this. Uh, you may have, let's say if I were doing my geology lecture in the fall and it was Tuesday, Thursday at 1230, I might say, okay, this week we're going to go ahead and have our regularly scheduled Zoom session on Monday at 1230. We'll, we'll have stuff to work through, but we're not going to meet on Thursday because I'm going to have you do these um, asynchronous learning activities instead. Uh, the question then becomes, I mean, whether we're talking about this model where we're not adjusting the times or we're doing this model, the question then becomes, what is, and I don't know if I can select this, what is the most important um, activities that we can do right, we can target for this time when we are together in the room, whether that room is our classroom on campus or whether that room is our Zoom session. So um, let's have some conversation about that. If you think about your Zoom sessions that you are uh, structuring for your fall remote class, what are the most important things for you to do during those times when you're together with your students? And what are things that are less, re that less require the synchronous uh, um, situation when you're all together there in the room? Well, Leandro, are you uh, getting ready to? I know. Um, no, I, I was actually thinking that instead of being an hour and 40 minutes in lecturing in the class, which is kind of boring, and, and then you realize that not everyone is there paying attention. Uh, I, I can record a 40 minute lecture that people can watch uh, beforehand and really spend good 30, 40 minutes in class, in my case, debating primary sources, for instance. So students would be applying what they saw in the lecture, and then we can cover questions, break them in different groups, and that's pretty much it. Right. I mean, so, more intense work class, uh, grouping during the, 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 the personal interaction, and do all the delivery of content beforehand. Yep. Yeah, so content delivery is something that we can approach in a number of ways. Certainly, there's no reason why I can't decide that um, for this particular topic, I need to spend 10 to 15 minutes explaining this topic to my students. And I want to do it in my Zoom room so that I can at least every now and then take a look at their expressions and see what's going on. But oftentimes, when we're delivering content, it does not necessarily require it to be a synchronous activity. So as Leandro says, there are various tools we can use uh, to pre-record, to, to offload the, the delivery, the basic delivery of content, get that out of our synchronous time, uh, and offload it into, say, voice thread lectures, or maybe I've got a tablet with a whiteboard application that I use to record my lectures, or maybe um, 
maybe my lecture is just I'm going to get on my phone and I'm going to be walking around campus so that there's, there's a nice background or walking around the, the park and I'm, I'm just going to um, uh, I've got some topic that I can talk to my students for just recording myself on the phone for 10-15 minutes have them watch that ahead of time and then I don't have to take our time during the zoom session to actually cover that material now what do I need to do to make sure that my students are actually watching my 40-minute lecture ahead of time well there are various ways uh, you can um, You know, you can do the kinds of things you do to make sure the students are doing the readings ahead of time. You can do reading response papers. You can do low stakes quizzes uh, that um, uh, show that the students are engaged with that material. Uh, actually, I've got a workshop Thursday afternoon on using the interactive uh, video activity in the H5P plug-in in our Moodle systems where I could record my lecture and wrap it around uh, in, in inside this interactive video thing and make sure that the students are periodically stopping and responding to prompts or questions or other uh, interactive elements in the in the lecture um, I, I would like to I'm not, Go ahead, am I allowed to say something? Yeah, sure. So I used VoiceThread for snow days and well, I had bad experience because I had to videotape or record myself multiple times because it crashed on me or it didn't save it. And then the disappointment came when I saw how many students watched it. It was maybe 10, maybe 20% or so. And basically I went over the slides or, or I had to fly over the slides in the next one because actually we had to move on. Right. So I'm in theory, I think it's great to have voice thread up front and then have maybe less, less uh, synchronous time. So I have three lecture meetings a week. So I would maybe meet only twice a week for zoom and discuss it. But I definitely, I'm, I'm certain I will lose those students. I would kind of lose and I will definitely lose yeah. them this way. Um, I don't know, so on quizzes, um, well, for I'm a chemist, Moodle quizzes, it's not like I click on 100 questions and put them in Moodle and I have 100 questions there. I have to draw every single question and answer. So I cannot ask questions about the, the uh, I have, I would have to have 10 times more prep time as I usually have. So yeah. that's not an option. So it's, I don't know what the best recipe is. I mean, these are issues that we all need to uh, work through for our classes. Um, um, and it may be that your best option is, well, I've got my lectures in PowerPoint and I can deliver them through Zoom. I mean, there's, there's no, nothing that says that using synchronous Zoom time to present content is, is bad. I mean, there aren't, there aren't value judgments here. There is which is the best mix for, our, for my class to make sure that for the time that we're meeting together, we're using it for the, the activities that will be most important for that time. I mean, the way I look at it is whether we're meeting face-to-face -face in our classrooms or whether we are meeting in Zoom, that time together, I, I like to think of it as a precious commodity. And, and it's limited. Uh, and therefore, what is the, the best activities that I want to use it for? In, in, you know, in a certain case, it might be I need to, I need to use that time to present the material because my presenting the material real time is the most effective way to present that material. Um, whereas, uh, you know, uh, for a different class, it might be, oh, this, this content delivery is easily offloaded. Therefore, I'm going to offload it and that will free up time. I don't necessarily have to reduce the amount of time. I don't have to go to a blended approach. 
I may still keep the same amount of synchronous time, but use more of it for um, uh, for working uh, problem sets, for doing small group discussions, for uh, for setting up, you know, maybe project-based or team-based or case study uh, approaches. So, I mean, that's the focus. I mean, that's really kind of what I want you all to think about for your classes based on the conversations we're having today. I'm going to have a certain amount of time together with my students, real time, do I want to rethink or not what we're doing in that time? Uh, do I want to rethink what I'm having students do outside of class so that we can maybe um, think about uh, in different ways what we're doing in class? So um, let's, let's spend some time now. Um, uh, let me go ahead and share the screen again for just a minute. There is, uh, University of Central Florida has uh, long led um, the country in its programming around helping faculty think about blended learning uh, and this balance between synchronous and asynchronous and what you're going to do, uh, on, uh, what kind of activities you're going to do in each of those environments. Uh, and they have this blended learning toolkit course, which is uh, an openly licensed course. It, however, is really set up to be this six week long course redesign uh, 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 program, and clearly we're not going to do that in a one hour, uh, in a two hour workshop uh, one afternoon um, during this week. So what uh, I want to do for our workshop today is uh, pick out one specific uh, one of their course activities, uh, their course design activities, which is most, I think, directed at this issue of uh, how am I going to figure out what's the best balance between synchronous and asynchronous activities for my courses. Um, so um, let me copy this link into the chat. Um, let's go ahead and spend the next, uh, have everyone uh, go to this, uh, download this Word doc, and I'll open it up in a minute and we can take a look at it. I think it's a useful planning tool um, that you can um, use as you're thinking about this balance between synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning activities and what you want to structure where. So uh, go ahead and download, download that. Let me pull it up through the screen share. So this, this worksheet um, is actually partway through this whole course design process that they've set up at UCF. Um, in the program, uh, faculty have already spent some time thinking about their learning outcomes for their class, how they can break their class up into different modules, and, and how the outcomes for the different modules uh, relate to what the students need to accomplish for the course, and then uh, begin to think about, you know, this relationship between what's going on asynchronously outside of class versus what's going on in class. I think for our purposes today, uh, it would be possible just for you to um, to take this 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 word doc and just think about one small chunk of your class, whether it's a specific topic or you know the material you cover in a particular week, or if you do have your course uh, broken up into units. Don't take don't take anything really large, but just some small 
piece of, of one of your courses. And then the goal of this activity is to think about what the students need to accomplish when they have completed this chunk of the course. What learning activities will the students do in order to meet those outcomes? What resources do they have to work with uh, in order to, do, do they need to work through in order to uh, carry out those? And then what are the kinds of uh, interactions that you would hope students would have as they're working through these learning activities? Um, and then finally, you know, what are the tools um, that you might want to use in order to support these? So that's, this is kind of a whole backwards course design process. If uh, you're not familiar with the backwards course design process, it's pretty much what do I want my students to accomplish? What do they need to, to do in order to accomplish those objectives? What resources do they need? who are they going to be interacting with, and then it's only finally what tools um, will the students need to do that. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to pause. Uh, yeah, that, that workshop on uh, um, integrating Zoom into Moodle, it's up on our TLTC site. Okay. And, um, yeah, Marie has popped in the, the link there. Uh, I, I popped into a number of the rooms. It seemed like there were some good conversations going on. Um, and so we are, we are recording. Um, uh, so again, this... Um, Somebody's watching the... Uh, <laughs> uh, Zoom. So uh, let's just see uh, what I want to finish up with. Because uh, if we can get out here a little early, that would be fine as well. Um, you know, so hopefully there were some, some good conversations. It, it, as I said, the breakout rooms I went into um, seem to be having some good ones. I don't know if there's any particular, if any of the groups want to uh, report out on anything in particular that that um, that they talked about, it's not mandatory. But if something really neat came up in your conversation and you want to share with the the rest of the group, uh, we can take a little bit of time right now. Uh, Pat, you got your hand up. I do. Yes. So um, the thing that came up for us, although only two of us had use this um asynchronously like when i did a hybrid a few years ago i feel like what i need the most help with is how do i make this discussion forums engaging i they just right. never want to do them and i would be happy for them to engage away and then they're they end up being a chore for me because right. they're not in, you know i'm just zooming through their zoom zoom. i don't know if there's somewhere to get that information or yeah, um, I think we did do a workshop last spring about uh, online discussions, but we can certainly, I mean, that um, that certainly would be worth revisiting as another workshop uh, sometime in the summer. There are certainly ways you can configure the, there are different kinds of, of uh, discussion, discussion forums you can use in Moodle. Some are better suited for some purposes than others. And, um, you know, there are also best practices in terms of how you participate on the forum in ways to, that doesn't shut down the discussion by students. But yeah, let, let me think about that, Pat, and think about um, um, putting together a session on that. Um, Okay, so let me. Um, Keith, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I was not in one of the groups that had anybody in studio art, but I have my husband here who actually is wondering if anybody had any ideas about how to do a crit, like in studio art crit online that is in this way. So 
describe how describe the essential features for doing it face to face um yes <laughs> Uh, so a face-to-face -face crit would involve um, usually a group showing of uh, student work. Sometimes it's one by one, but somehow there is uh, actual work in front of everybody. And there is also a group of students with the instructor um, present. And, just, and then many people are going to do this differently, but somehow students engage in close looking and then verbal discussion of this work, ideally using some kind of common vocabulary so that, you know, I know what you're talking about and other people know what we're talking about. And through that, you know, students ideally learn to see their work maybe in a different way, um, to recognize what they're doing, to see how, it, you know, what they think they're doing and see the gap between what they're okay. actually doing and what they think they're doing. So I guess one question I would have would be, this would be perhaps tough to do in Zoom because you're not going to be able to arrange the the room in Zoom the way you would do it face to face more than likely. I'm wondering if this might not be something that could be done asynchronously. Could each student post a high quality image of their work onto a discussion board posting or as a slide in voice thread where uh, then it's it, it's not you coming in and commenting on the slides but or, or the discussion forum posts but uh, other students are uh, opening up the discussion forum posts looking at the work and then using the reply function to provide their feedback on it <laughs> you don't get quite the immediate give and take that you might have depending on how you set up your crits in face-to-face -face classroom but it could have an ongoing conversation about each student's piece of work where all the students would be able to weigh in they'd be able to it depending on how you set it up they, they would probably be able to see what other students had already commented on this particular piece and then they would add their perspective so that might be something that we should discuss in more detail and, and see if that would, would fit your needs. Keith, can I make a comment here? Yeah. Okay. Um, what I was doing, um, and this is sort of typical of what a lot of people in studio arts were doing, um, was I made a Google Drive folder for the class. I gave every student a folder and for each project, that was due, they would take several pictures of the piece yep. and download it, put it into that their folder. I would ask students to look at the folders the day before the crit, but then during the crit, because I think it is really important to have that sort it's of spontane spontaneous, you know, live right. conversation, then we would talk about that, the work, you know, whoever was presenting would open their folder, put up the work and then they would, we would have a conversation about it. Yeah. And I guess that could be done in Moodle using voice thread maybe? Well, or, um, to me. Th there's also a Lightbox gallery resource that we've added to, uh, to Moodle where uh, students might be able to, you could set that up so that students could post uh, pictures of their work as uh, basically slides in the, in the Lightbox gallery. Oh, okay. And have you done a workshop on that yet? Uh, no, but um, actually given uh, the mix of programs we have here at Purchase, I maybe should think about doing a Lightbox Gallery workshop. Yeah, that, uh, that, that'll be really useful, especially if it's not as clunky as Moodle could be before. The problem was, you know, uh, that the orientation of files would, would change once they were uh, mm -hmm. dropped into Moodle. And so that's why at least for, uh, for photo, we preferred to kind of look at it in Google Drive, right, and then you know, so it was like a, a somewhat like a, a hybrid version of being on Moodle, but then um, putting bringing in uh, Google Drive. The one thing that I would also add to that the critique question um, is that I, in my experience, it took a little bit longer 
the critiques took longer than in person in class yeah. just because yeah we wanted the students to look at the stuff before on the google drive then look at it on their own while in class and then the person whose work it was would share their screen and show the work and so and i and i think that's actually really important to see the work multiple times but one of the things even with photo something as flat as photo that i'm realizing as we are going through these discussions is to actually ask them to not only post like uh, you know the entire image as they would obviously do but also um you know go in and make like some detailed right. uh crops and post that as multiple images uh something that we would do in person right going cl close to the work and then going further away and sort of creating that kind of experience by yeah. multiple images and you know imagining i think it's a good useful exercise for someone who's in their early 20s to even think about how their work is going to be uh, experienced right. online. So, so here's the overall picture of my work, but here's this detail that I want you to focus in on as well. Mm -hmm. And in yeah. sculpture, some of the students ended up doing little videos where they would yep. literally walk around the piece or walk through it if it was an installation. One of the Lightroom sounds interesting because I guess the the situation that I'm trying to recreate online. Is what I call the wall of work. That is, students bring in, I don't know, ten pieces a piece, and everybody hangs stuff up. And you might have a wall with like seventy, eighty, a hundred pieces on it, um, yeah. relatively small sometimes. And it's very and and through the um, comparison of everybody's work in time and space, students can learn a lot about how yeah. people are approaching the same thing. It's not a situation where like tell me about your work in isolation and then tell me about your work in isolation. One thing I started doing was putting things onto the grid of, of WordPress. And that gave you a little legal thumbnails that you can kind of click on. And yeah. set up. But that challenge of sort of seeing a lot of work at one time and making these cross comparisons remains quite elusive to me. So uh, this is not in Moodle, but there's a tool that I uh, have a lot of colleagues that use for various things called Padlet, which basically lets you create a wall of objects. And so uh, send, send, send an email to TLTC and, and we can maybe... Um, uh, can you say that name again? Padlet? Padlet. P-A-D-L-I-T? L-E-T. -E okay. Oh, 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 Padlet. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, I, let, to finish off, let me just say I'm going to send you a bunch of stuff. Um, there are some other activities from the Blend Kit course that I thought I might pull up, but I'm not going to take the time. Uh, as I said, the the whole Blend Kit course itself is like this whole six week long pr program, but there are some other. Um, uh, activities that might be useful in how in providing a framework for you all to think about your cor your courses um, one thing that i don't think we'll take the time to talk about um, but especially if you are trading off uh, asynchronous learning activities for some part of your regular seat time question is how much asynchronous stuff is enough to uh to make up you know the like the carnegie um requirements um not that i want to go here so th i've pulled up some documents from different from, from some different places so for example i mean if you're having students watch a recorded ted talk that is 28 minutes long that's obviously 28 minutes of instructional time, right? And so there are various ways that you can approximate, because uh, four hours Carnegie credit is basically 100 contact hours and eight uh, hours of outside class work. So uh, what does that mean for discussion board posts? What does that mean for uh, you know online group work and so forth? So uh, this this document from Curry, this one from Crichton, 
Creighton and this one from RIT I thought were pretty good. So I'll send those around to you. Um, and then, uh, you know, just to finish off, we've, we've, this has not been a tool heavy talk. And, you know, I wanted to be a little bit of a different uh, from our march or, or from our death marches through Moodle tools uh, we did last week. But, uh, you know, I have been thinking about what are some of the tools, Moodle and otherwise, that you might want to use to get students ready for your synchronous time. What are some things to use uh, during this, uh, your Zoom sessions? What are some post-class tools? Uh, I really want to make a plug here for Perusal, which is a new tool that we have in Moodle. Um, many of, I mean, if you look back here, uh, we're having students do a lot of reading to get ready for classes. Uh, and uh, how then to make sure that the students are actually engaging with the reading. Um, Perusal is a social annotation platform so that you basically can add, and, and I've done a workshop on this, we'll probably do another workshop later, the recording is up on our YouTube channel, but um, you add Perusal to your Moodle course, it basically creates a perusal course space for you where you can you can upload all different kinds of resources. You can put up PDFs of articles. This is actually an open openly licensed text. So this is you know a, a hundred hundreds of long pages, hundreds of pages long PDF uh, from my physical geology textbook. Uh, and then what Perusal does is does a social annotation layer around these different resources. So um, rather than having putting up an article and then having all of your 18 students read that individually, and maybe some of them take notes, maybe some of them don't, the document's up there and the students are all taking notes, doing annotations on, on a layer above the document so that they're all sharing their insights about the reading. And you can be in there, you can see who's annotating what, you can make actual assignments that you want students to do, you know, specific things as they're annotating. So um, I'm really gonna try to be pushing this perusal tool that we've got because so many of us rely on student close examination of readings as part of our instruction, I think this will be a very nice uh, addition there. So um, hopefully this has been an interesting conversation, a useful conversation. Again, uh, my, my goal was not to be really content heavy and be just be presenting, you know, tool after tool after tool to you, but clearly as you're thinking about your blend between what you want to do in your synchronous time, whether you want to trade off any of that synchronous time for asynchronous activities or not, or what kind of asynchronous activities will get your students prepared to make mo best use of your synchronous time. If you've got any questions along those lines, you've got any questions about tools that you are thinking about using to, to support that, you want uh, feedback on um, you know, your thoughts about the blend that you want to design for your course, you know, please just email us at tltc at purchase.edu, which uh, Marie just put into the chat and uh, we'll get back in touch with you and, and have whatever consultations you, you know, need or want to have to make sure that you're set up with what you want to do in your, with your courses in the fall. Um, I'm sort of spent though. Uh, if uh, anyone has any last comments they want to make or, or you know, obviously you can put them in the chat or, um, We'll have the recording. I wasn't sure what the recording would be like for this kind of a session since it was kind of meant to be more, more of a conversation, but I think it will be probably useful. And uh, 
I see people saying thank you in the chat. So um, again, Barry wants me to send out pretty much twice weekly what's coming up. So expect to see frequent emails from me about upcoming workshops or conferences elsewhere. We've got some faculty members who are interested in doing sessions. If if you know of anyone or if you're interested, actually, Mary Waller, you were, what were we talking about in your breakout room? You were really talking about how to use Zoom breakout rooms. So maybe I'll, I'll tag you to do something for a, a workshop session. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.